from last year uh, to provide that match. So we had $5,000 which was the cost roughly to scan these newspapers. And so, um, you know, just scanning by, uh, you can browse the issues by date. I was curious a while back what I might find if I went to the year 1902 and um, uh, check the October newspapers. And so I found a newspaper in here from October uh, 16th of 1902. And I uh, looked at these papers enough to know that page three is where the local news is. So when I called up page three <clears throat> to read the uh, local news from the Klamath Republican in October from 120 uh, years ago, I was able to find an article about the fairgrounds. And so it says here that Judge Baldwin took the newspaper editor on a little tour. They got in a buggy. They rode from uh, the courthouse down to uh, the fairgrounds, which was about a half mile uh, east of town. Um, and I was so pleased to find this article, which describes the town. Grandstands that they had just built. So I decided to uh, use that as our uh, Facebook photo of the week, which is uh, now covered up here. Let's see if I can get that down. Here it is right here. So here's our Facebook page showing the grandstands that they had gone to visit um, this month, 120 years ago. And I was able to use that newspaper and to put the two together and it made a pretty fascinating Facebook post that uh, went over pretty well with people following us on Facebook. So uh, thank you to the Historical Society for providing that much. Thank you to the Nickel fan for uh, providing the donation to your organization, the Historical Society. And me and Mary that also helped put the program together on, on uh, Bill Kitt that started the whole thing. Applegate, you just mentioned a story related to the Applegate Trail. All the way Applegates are related to the Applegate Trail. Yeah, there were three brothers that came uh, across the trail back in um, 1846. Uh, so let's see, I think that's that all I have to announce. Um, I would like to make an introduction in case you haven't met our new curator. So sitting there in the plaid shirt, there, go ahead and raise your hand high. So yeah, we can see who you are. Welcome, you Matt. Grew up in Lakeview and um, uh, went to BYU for his undergraduate degree. And just left spring summer. Um, when he and Clark Horton were very happy to have him here. And so uh, if you need to know anything about the Snake River, uh, our government's campaign against Snake River Indians, uh, more about the Modoc War and about the uh, Paiute people than I do. So just get me and go right back if you need information about uh, that. He's picking up on a lot of other things very quick. So, uh, so um, what was that? Our next meeting is you know, the end of the year, and, and it's going to be on for 12th, which will be Sunday afternoon at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we'll, we will install all of, our, all of our new officers and we have paid. We have been never saying we will have paid. <laughs> so you don't want to miss out. That's great. That's great. That's great. Well, it's Sunday there. Oh, sure. Seven, twelve, somewhere in the office. The new president here is going to stop here. Sorry, yeah, it's uh, Sunday. Thirteenth, not the twelfth. Oh, the thirteenth, and there's twenty-two. So, yeah. okay. Object disappeared. Well, I always keep the candles in the rail, handy oh, just in case. Uh, yeah, so um, I wanted to just mention that whenever I give a program in public, and I've given quite a few in just the last week, I've spoken to two Rotary Clubs and the Time of Falls uh, Kiwanis Club. And whenever I give a presentation, I always like to show this slide uh, to uh, make note of the fact that the uh, museum has two nonprofit partners, and um, that would be uh, the Historical Society, of course, and uh, the Foundation. Uh, so those of us that work in the museum are county employees, 
And uh, we don't have a membership structure for the museum. If people want to be a member of something that supports our museum, we have to join your organization, the Historical Society. And then the Museum Foundation is also working with endowment to support museum operations for decades into the future. And there's at least one foundation board member here, uh, Neil Everlight, if you were in here. And Neil, Neil is one of several people that serve on uh, that foundation. Great work, and they're about to send out their annual appeals. So if you'd like to contribute to the foundation's um, endowment fund that will support this museum for, um, please be aware of that and write and check or think about the museum and your plan to get it. Uh, um, so I guess I'm going to have to enlarge my window here. Before we get into the Telford votes, I wanted to make note of the fact that uh, Matt has been coming to me all week with stuff like, look what I found upstairs. I'm like, I've never seen that before. And so one of the items that I've never seen before was a couple of photos of Ziegler boats. Uh, Charles Ziegler had uh, the Leak River boat operation uh, up at the Battle where Pelican Marina is now, I think. Uh, but we don't know much about uh, Mr. Ziegler. I did a search for him in the newspapers today on our newspaper archive and didn't come up uh, with much. But there's these great photos of him with his uh, car. Um, actually, uh, Chris Tipton, that looks like about your, not like your car, which you got <laughs> uh, now. You know, I think yours is a little newer than that. So if anybody knows anything about the Ziegler boat operation, we'd love to learn more about that. But we're really here tonight to talk about uh, the Telford Boat Company. And so here's as a letterhead. Uh, can I make that go away? Uh, that green bar there. Well, ignore the green bar. So, uh, damn. Uh, so here's a piece of letterhead uh, from uh, the Telford Boat Company. And it looks hand corner there, H.C. Telford, which was uh, Henry Telford, is that right, yeah. uh, John? And in the right-hand uh, corner, Ray Telford. Uh, I'm going to spend most of my time, my part of the program tonight, kind of focusing on Ray. Ray's grandson is here, John Cool, and he's sitting in the back row there. We're going to call him up here pretty quick, and uh, he and I are going to just kind of go back and forth and share uh, what we know about the uh, Telford operation. So here's a picture that uh, John gave us a while, and that shows uh, Ray Telford there on the right with uh, his brother, right, Wilbur. And of course, you can tell where they're at, right? They're at the Crater Lake. Yeah, and we'll talk more about it. Oh, it's Harris. Next younger brother. He was only about 14 or so. Okay, so that's where I probably got the story. So, um, Ray Telford, uh, Henry before him, I suppose, had a boat uh, operation, a boat building operation on the Link River. This is a, a map showing Main Street, the Main Street Bridge across the Link River here at uh, the Baldwin Hotel is in the next, oh, the Baldwin Hotel is right here. And so, uh, well, this is Telford Brothers Garage. I never noticed that until Yeah, okay. Uh, but the Telford right here, I do believe. So this is Link River here going upstream. And then the Telford building is this one right here. We've got a, uh, I think I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, this is Main Street again, Conger Avenue going up this way. And so right on this corner here, right on the shoreline, the number of filters and then the boat the construction building. And here's a picture of those buildings with, uh, if this will work as a pointer, this building here. Um, being that bigger building. John, where do yes, you and they built living quarters above it. Oh, and they did. They seeded up around it. Lived after the you know, nine. Interesting. The bulk shop was below that. 
Okay, so down closer to the water level in the chocolate. Here's an interior photo, which uh, was labeled as Ray Telford in the boathouse. You don't think that's Ray? No, I don't. It doesn't look like he never built plank boats like that. I, I didn't think it was uh, Ray either, but that does it look like we have the right building? Oh. Well, that previous picture is right, but I think this photo is not tied to anything. Yeah, that's that's the Telford boathouse. Um, yeah, the windows don't look right, do they? It's not impossible to have an order for that type of uh, square fence and plank. All both, but I, I don't think so. John, you might want to go ahead and move up here to the front row so you'll be closer to the team so that people uh, watching by Zoom uh, can hear you. I wonder if that um, on the upper right. Yeah, the white, 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 white. Yeah. Okay. Cladawa. Uh, Cladawa. And who was this built for? You know, the Telford's. Uh, built out, I think, in 1909, and they used it primarily for uh, birding tours into the South Lake in the springtime. And many pictures of people in their Sunday best, ladies <laughs> writing, um, examining the pelican rookeries and cormorants. <laughs> this is an order of boats, uh, these traditional clinker boats, talk about more, uh, that for Diamond Lake Resort. And you can see that ramp in the background. That was a, a side, I don't know, a pedestrian ramp that went to the living quarters above the folks' house. So Conger Avenue is on the right, will be off the view to the right. right. And so that ramp that you're talking about was going out towards the river. Uh, this is a Mod Baldwin photo. You can always tell Mod's photos anytime you see a scribbled, kind of scribbly handwriting like that. That's almost always mm -hmm. uh, Mod's. Uh, signature there. So uh, here's an article from, guess what, the Klamath Republican newspaper, an article that I'm able to show you tonight because of the digitization that I was able to find. And I don't want that to go away quite yet, so let me back up. Uh, so this is a report from 1906, which says a new industry is springing up in the city, one that bids fair to grow um, to considerable proportions. It's boat building. Uh, Telford and Sons started about a year ago. Uh, they have, in the course of construction, two Two horsepower boats, 16 uh, foot launches. What's a foot launch? 16, 16 foot, foot launches, 16 foot long. They've completed an 18 foot, three horsepower launch. I expect to begin construction on a 22 foot, six horsepower launch. One of the 16 footers is for uh, uh, J.F. Gaylor, um, J. Fred Gaylor. What was the J? I can't remember what the J was for. He just uh, J. Fred Gaylor most of the time. And then the 22 footer for uh, Alva Lewis. Um, so this is an interesting article that talks about how much the boats cost. The cost for a 16 foot boat, 100, and an 18 footer, $250. There were not a lot of people in town that could afford boats on that scale, uh, but Mr. Gaylor and uh, Mr. Lewis um, both. Here's an article from uh, the Evening Herald newspaper in 1909. And along the same lines, boat building is a growing industry. And I've got uh, a portion of that. Again, the boat building is off uh, to large proportions. A visit to the Telford and Sun shops on the river on Conger Avenue would soon convince the extent of the industry. Uh, down here, it reports they've constructed 12 gasoline launch ranging in length from 16 to 36 feet. Orders are now on hand far in excess of any year. Uh, so, um, yeah, they did not plan to make it a full time business, according to the story in the Republican, um, but uh, it's turned into quite an uh, enterprise. Rebuilt, uh, rebuilt, built by Telford and Son is giving perfect satisfaction, and they put some speedy launches. Talk a little bit more about some of the racing aspects uh, of the boat building. Uh, here's 24 now uh, about uh, Johnson Outboard Motors. And John brought more what vintage that is. 1926. Still runs. Oh. Horse and a half. 
at 120 Conger Avenue. Uh, so here's a picture of the Wokus. Uh, you know where this picture is? Oh, yeah, the, the uh, lower climate lake before it was all green. Yeah. And, you know, they were, you know, okay, cuts through the tea so you can boat through it in places. So this is July the 4th, 1930, at Lake of the Woods, in front of this then resort, Lake of the Woods, very near where Camp Low Echo, or, or more recently Camp DeBoer is. So more towards the south end of the lake. Right? Yes, the southeast side. And it's significant to me because <laughs> my grandfather's family photo, I'm pretty sure, uh, but I think that's my grandfather right there. Yeah. He had in that boat is, is distinctive with the dual oarlocks. That's a clinker. And no, I, I'm so see how virtually all the other boats are square sided, hard chine, square transom. Boy, I didn't want to get to that. Uh, report for 1929 um, the Crater Lake, a 40 uh, passenger launch, will be used on Crater Lake this summer. Um, Ray Telford of this city has been working um, on the launch for the past two months. Well, he can crank out a boat like that in two months. Yeah. yeah. How many boats do you think you might have made over the years? Well over 100, just the clinker, the 15-foot clinker rowboat, like you saw in that picture of the Diamond Lake Order. Something similar to what? Similar to this, but this is a specific design. Hmm. But this is the second boat uh, that's 1929. He built two of these big launches for Crater Lake. And this previous picture you just had up there is from 1924. Uh, and that is uh, Ray Telford in the boat. And uh, I'm not sure who the little boy is. But this is right in front of the boat shop on Conger Avenue. This, this is that ramp that we were, that right, we were pointing out before. Ramp, the living quarters. And Wilbur by Winter Steele, the superintendent of, uh, of the Crater Lake Park, and Wilbur was my grandfather's younger brother. Mm -hmm. We've got some pictures. I don't know if these are all of the same boat, yeah, but I count a sequence now of the boat being loaded. So uh, that's also on Conger Avenue, looking up on the hillside. I don't know if any of those homes. Right the purple one? No, uh, the uh, House of Seven Gables. <laughs> um, so now we're up at Crater Lake. And uh, it's just interesting to study the way they got this thing loaded and um, tied into a cradle. Uh, I didn't ask Todd if I could bring props like this. 1926 Albert Motor, I just did it. Uh, <laughs> my grandfather's 1913 Cadillac is chained to the truck of unknown era. This is 1924. And the truck could not make the grades on the gravel rim loader without some help. And I, I have in the yard on Pine Rabbit where they live until my grandmother assisted the old wreck be hold up. <laughs> okay, and the other thing is it, that car, the 13 Cadillac, was the first American made production car that had an electric target and not like a self commensurate, as you call it. And uh, not only that, This shows you the, the uh, amazing thing that's going on in recent days where people with money spend extra large amounts of extra money to make their hard to with the motor by democracy and legend. I mean, <laughs> So they uh, took the boat around the east side to uh, the glass. You know where that is. Um, I'm actually going to get out of here for just a second. 
uh, website that means stop share. What I need to do is uh, here. Yeah, you want to see who all's in there? That's <laughs> all right. I just wonder why is that there? Yeah, Tim signed it. Um, so I want to get a PowerPoint. So let's uh, exit the show and uh, go back. Map. So uh, here's a map of uh, Crater Lake. Um, the rim of Crater Lake averages about one feet above the surface of the water. Uh, on the northeast shore of the lake, there's where the road came right up to the rim of the lake. And this is called the wine glass. Because uh, there's a kind of a wine glass shaped formation of the vegetation up there. And so you can see uh, that the road comes really close to the water there. In fact, if I just do a quick street, this would be the spot right here. Uh, so you can see there's, there's still 100 feet above the water here, but this is the lowest point that you can easily get to on the rim of Crater Lake water. So that was the spot. Uh, we're parked right here in order to uh, lower the boat in. So we'll see how that process worked. Um, this is, I guess, a picture of a guy getting it ready to put on to the slide. And here's probably the point where your heart throbbing, going over the edge, and then sliding it down the side of the caldera. Did you say this is the first boat? I, I understand. Yeah. And what became of this boat? Well, I don't know which boat was room. An avalanche on the Wizard Island where the boathouse was swept one of the boats right out into the lake, along with, and they eventually, Wilbur, found it at Fleetwood Cove, where the, where the trail was now down to the lake. And he salvaged the engine out of it. And this really? was, you know, in June the next year. But I, I really don't know which, which boat uh, survived. and, and uh, it didn't, or whether or not it replaced it. I, I don't have that. You can see the three guys, four, four guys uh, down there to give a perspective on how big this uh, was. Okay, and this is topic here. So let's come back to, okay. to that. I need this short newspaper article. This is in the Galena Gazette from uh, July 22nd, 1924. Where's Galena? Galena is on the Mississippi River in Illinois. My grandfather's. H.C.'s, my great grandfather's hometown, and my grandfather was born. Fred Lake, the launching of a 34 foot motorboat over a thousand foot into a lake located in the crater, in the crater of a steep volcano without start, unique in the history of launchings. On July 3rd, Crater Lake's new motor launch saw a first service after his career in a spectacular manner described. The crew of six men worked three days to watch and boat in service. And without a doubt, the most interested workers of the crew were the Telford brothers. Uh, up to that time, all motor boats on use in Crater Lake had been constructed at shore. Not right. The new launch is 34, eight, 34 feet, eight inches, tipped with 30 horsepower anchor engine, will accommodate 40 people and make 12 miles an hour downwind. These constructed bars need hard work, time, et cetera. Crew of six. That's the, so this is the hometown paper and that really dated it better than anything because there, there are quite a few incorrect dates. So quick stories, um, grandpa had a bucket of lard to grease the skids going down. And it got it all the way to the water, the boat was in the water, and it had this beautiful little upholstery and he took the lard in the boat and overnight buried out in there. It's <laughs> <laughs> all mess all the <laughs> Uh, why don't we talk about objects for a little while? Did you bring any other objects you want to talk well, about? Um, so many of you have already seen the wooden cartridges, and these were my great grandfather at Mosley. Um, I'm doing a little guessing here, but uh, my grandfather had really more modern tools available to him. But I had a great grandfather's old box that came from Galena, Illinois, and there are many interesting things. Wood. Uh, so you're shaping them. They did uh, family business in Galena. Great grandfather, great 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 grandfather was an architect, and they built houses. And these houses, nice houses, had fancy woodwork. And in fact, the first 
John, my grandparents, my grandfather got with his father was building the key turret on the new high school right above Climber Falls. There are three for some reason they spent money on turrets and we had fancy woodwork. Well, so these are shapers, and you couldn't just go by a very shape. You often had to rip it out of large stock and shape it yourself. Uh, a good example is this <laughs> plane, which can change its radius between the inside or the outside of a shape, a round shape. And <clears throat> let me take that. This is my favorite of the tools that you've done. All of the tools in this case were helper tools that John has had for I don't know how many years. And he, Donated them to the museum um, a few months ago. And I said, we got to do a program about this mm -hmm. uh, program. So um, this thing has a, an adjustment on it, a knob here that changes the flex of the plane. So yeah, now it's on A, and then I can turn it the other one. And, and now it's uh, concave, right? Because as uh, John pointed out the last time we talked about this, when you look at that boat, everybody is square, a straight line anywhere on it. Everything has to be done on a curve. And so allowed you know, plenty to occur on a curve. Yes. And so that, that's the focus equals and good because the lady lady cupboards, they had brass, they had brass, they had brass. I think cost and weight. I brought this. This is a 1902 patent plane. It really is a modern plane. It weighs about three times more than this shaper thing. The wood is probably undoubtedly cheaper, a lot lighter. You have to run it all day. So I suspect price, weight had a lot to do with why they had wood. Because it certainly metal was available. Now, another thing to notice is this is just a regular plane with a flat surface, but that one that you said there. Mm -hmm. um, you can put that on. Right. Notice it's got a curve, it's got a curved blade. Might be used for a rating, curving a rating for many parts on the boat. And again, this is what Todd said the boats did have spray board. My grandfather had a huge bandsaw in his yard with a stationary motor to run it, and he would cut big planks into smaller pieces on that bandsaw. It was Fairbanks motor, Fairbanks Morris motor. You might have one around here. And then it would pop, 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 run that bandsaw. So I loved that as a kid. Um, now I forgot to check the viewers. You mind if I forget? The level uh, is just beautiful in there. One of the things we found out that either the floor is not level or the case is not. <laughs> the level's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. So, Neil Everland, you see him in here earlier this morning, he walked this way and the level moved about it. Oh, I'm for that. <laughs> so another interesting thing to me is the color, the wooden color. That's casting one. And in his obituary, also reading uh, an old timer in time show that uh, claimed that it was in my grandfather in the cabs. I don't think that but he cast his propellers in the grass and brought it. You know, you do so much because they're as far out of the field as you want to But just a motor that I held up to the outboard. That was a breakthrough in the 20s. I think you're going to read some of the history. It weighs half as much, $140, which is a lot of money in the 20s. But it, it, they were light and reliable. You could reverse them. Nobody apparently would thought that the patent to that aspect. You can see the motor through a wrap. So I put over occasionally on a friend of mine's boat up at Lake of the Woods, and their family bought the boat to my grandparents and thought has that invoice on the photo of it. But that motor. And I like it, of course. You really change boating. Uh, and up to that point, it was roll or sail. Or they were very clunky and hard to maneuver. All right. Sure. Yeah. All right. A few more. That works good, good, doesn't it? Uh, so, um, there's Chris for Yeah, of uh, yeah. different like like Merriman Spring or Malone Spring on uh, West side of Upper Klamath Lake, if you're not familiar. And uh, so I just threw in a few other photos where telephone boats were used and where they appeared in uh, different photos. Um, of course, Nancy K. Yeah, so that was built for one of the lumber companies. Right? Yeah, this is some information on 
you want, but it, it was used uh, as a paragraph below it. It was used as a work book uh, for many years. Uh, would they have towed raw grass? This is in Pleasant Road, is it? Well, this is um, passenger road. Yeah, there's two pictures over here. The good ship opened for many years on the inner side of the lake. Wound up her career recently. It was dismantled because of age deterioration. deterioration. <laughs> uh, yeah. Built by Henry and Ray Tilford in 1910 for Pacific Railroad Company. First saw service hauling engineers to and from the work in the rail line along Upper Klamath Lakes. Picture taken at Shipping King Yard for the old craft for many years. Following duty with the engineers, the boat was purchased by the Klamath Falls Transportation Company. That adding the deck house, which the engineers scorned. Then Copco, California, Power, uh, acquired the boat in 1920 and used it extensively in their operations. But she met that she was added in duty some time ago. So it just shows what a quality boat on fresh water can do in terms of long term. I know it just occurred to me, John, as you were reading that, there's something I like to point out whenever I'm talking to audience that they're not the historical society there, you know, like the Kiwanis Club that maybe is not really dialed in on history like some of you guys are. It's important to understand that when um, when European Americans started moving into this area around here, travel was really difficult. The climate basin was isolated. It was one of the last places in Oregon to be settled because travel was so good here. Um, I mean, there's mountains all over Oregon, but this basin is surrounded by mountains that would extend during the winter. And even during the summer, when the roads were good, it was still hard to find a place to go because you've got these steep hillsides with our basin and rain topography area out there, basin and rain topography. Uh, so you got these steep, steep hillsides that come right down to the lake shore, and you can see when there's not room to put in a road. And so boat travel was vital to the natives and digital, and then it was also important to white folks when they started moving. In. So yeah. every company. Uh, the mail had to be delivered uh, by boat uh, during much of the year. So a lot of resources and hay production up around Fort Klamath and and lock on and that necessitated and sand sand uh, yep. dread of the Wood River. And yes, Doctor, what type of motors were installed in the launches to carry the rain? I, I think the brand was in Niagara, and I have no idea. No, no, just in, that's Niagara. in older gasoline. Uh, four four, four cylinder gasoline. Two cylinder. <laughs> Picture of uh, many pictures of the launches being run when they were as a teenager driving them. <laughs> Sir. So, your family, any relation to the boat builders and whales in Great Britain? You know, not that I know. I can tell if it's getting from Scotland. I, uh, that might great. be a, a good point to interject a very significant thing. I pointed out earlier that most of the robots saw in that photo of it was they were hard Chinese, big square transom, miserable to look. When you finish your stroke, they just stop. And so this is helper design, not a gun. And Todd has published some, so this goes back to Scandinavian design. It's just a lot more work to go like this with strips of wood. He would seem over with. Bendable and built the boats were built on a frame. I've seen the frame, not, nothing of it's fit. And you would anchor the planking, which I think this is quite fine, to the oaks with copper nails. And I thought that's where they got the name Flinker because you hold a hand the inside the boat and drive the copper nail through the planking through the uh, rim. It's clink, clink, clink. Well, no, you can Google it. That name Flinker's been around a long time. Lap straight, a more modern one. Quite a lap straight cabin But they have an efficient pole shape. So the Vikings may cover a big distance, and they're marvelous to row. And this is a racing row boat. I think it's only when he built. I'm not 54 percent sure of that statement, and I'm 34 percent sure that this is the one my father raced with. Uh, he wrote about the sliding sleep sink. Sleep, uh, sliding. Yeah. Anyway, so the construction. Whitehall. Whitehall boats uh, built along the same manner were very popular in Great Britain. And uh, I read a report uh, in the uh, Echoes that the pursuing Captain Jack in the lava beds 
decided they should get across to the lake initially. And they called in for um, two Whitehall rowboats. And so they went and looked at a Whitehall rowboat, and it's virtually identical to these pinker rowboats. Very efficient boat. If you're rowing around all day, you appreciate the same as much as the Scandinavian tribes did in efficient shape. There's a lot of work to do. So let's see if I learned this uh, correctly in the last couple of weeks preparing for this. A clinker boat refers to this the method of joining the boards together out of the hole of the boat. So instead of having boards that would just be snug up against each other edge and make a smooth uh, hole of the boat, these boards are overlapped a little bit, like lap siding on a house. They're overlapped by what, a half an inch? Yeah. Or so, which is amazing to me that they could make that work and so they would put how would they seal they would question uh, they caulked it with cotton roping uh, and the cotton would swell and and seal the crack they also painted it with a heavy low insulation my grandfather i have a clinker book it was a clinker that lives for my whole life it hangs from the rafters <coughs> uh, this building is fully known it never will be in the water again because i don't have the ambition to restore it but so he, we paint it every year. We put the little cleaner upside down and paint it with a white red paint. And so, yeah, the caulking, and that's all to do that caulk and, and the paint. So here's something I learned. I wanted to do this that the clinker technology, the clinker tradition of boat building was recognized within the last few years by UNESCO, United Nations Heritage. Mm -hmm. Or as a cultural, a distinct cultural heritage. There's only been, you know, like a hundred distinct cultural heritage of a distinct designation. Because it changes the appearance. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. So online thinker and United Nations UNESCO. Yeah. And, okay. But I mean, they've got like a 30 minute deal of that is explaining how the boats were built. And, Hold on, I didn't think we could get here. No, no. Uh, that boat, by the way, somebody asked, was that boat just donated to the ground? No, this boat has been in our collection, I think, since 1978. Go to Berg Becken, Muddy No Berg, B E R G A, Bill Becken's brother or father. I'm not sure. Um, I met. A bird back in here several years ago, um, but I don't know would have been him in 1978. I think it was Bird Beckham Senior. I thought it was somebody here. George, do you remember the name? Bill Beckham was Bill Beckham was Helen. You're talking about the newspaper reporter, Helen? I don't know if there was a connection there or not. Bill's mother. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk more about that. This is, is this your people here? This is the Telford family. Um, they lived in, a, in tents for about three months at the corner of Sixth and Pine to grow the trees before they could afford to move into a house nearby. And then right away, they were in, on um, the high school turrets. And also, they, in 1905, they did the English woodwork, finishing fancy work in the Waxteen of Wainema. I'm uh, sorry, I vote for just a second. So somebody asked if this boat had just been donated because they didn't remember seeing it before. <laughs> the boat has been in our museum on display since 1978, as far as I know. It's been top of exhibit cases, kind of out of sight. I mean, it's just there in plain sight. But yesterday, Matt and this technician and Dan Hawks and museum volunteer, the four of us put ropes around and hoisted it down. It was a little more challenging. And I thought I got a nice space full of dust um, process. <laughs> but it was historic. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. It was great. I don't know. No, okay. Never mind that picture. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, I'll make this. Okay, uh, a few fun things about the Telford boat operation. So, boats. Uh, are set to go. A 1928 tuned up, overhauled, completely outfitted, 
The two ice boats of Upper Klamath Lake are ready to skim over the ice surface of Upper Klamath Lake with passengers. It was announced today by Harry Telford, who with Douglas Puckett owns and operates the Speedy Ice Craft, capable of reaching a max speed of 90 miles an hour <laughs> at a possible 100 miles per with the wind behind. Mm -hmm. The boats are unique in the state. They are propelled by a 90 horsepower motor and operate the same as an airplane. The smallest is the flapper, 14 feet long, capable of being seven passengers. The largest, the Ella Poppin, can accommodate 12 passengers. We've got pictures of these boats. I do believe if they will give them to me. You know more than I do. What I was told by Grandpa was that that's was a World War One bomber air, airplane engine, and they tried to pull a hay sleds from Fort Concord at the time. Of, but you have proof that it's a passenger be a real noisy, windy place to ride. I think the wind would just uh, beat you to death. <laughs> Harry had lots of ideas. You read his stuff. <laughs> There, and hey, I'm vindicated. <laughs> and, and yeah. That's amazing to me that that would work. Coffee didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, Harry, also, remember the auto garage on Main Street that Todd showed on that? Well, Harry rode a bicycle from Hamilton Falls to Ontario, Oregon, with his little brother Wilbur's bicycle. He couldn't afford the extra hundred dollars to take the railroad to ship a Mets car, which came from Massachusetts to all the way to Pine Fall or Ashland. So he, he rode a bicycle a hundred miles and uh, to pick up that car and he was the Mets dealer in 1912. Uh, here's a story from the Evening Herald in uh, 1911 reporting that the uh, Evan R. Reed has um, purchased a 33 foot long boat. So it's not just little rowboats like this, if you will, in the fairly good sized craft. And uh, Evan Reeves would have been one of the few people in town who could have afforded it. Uh, that's the same Reeves that donated the land from Reeves Dolphin Country Club and uh, involved in a number of business enterprises uh, in town. Okay. So this this is the boat that I can put this outboard on. This, this boat was purchased by the Hodgman in Lake of the Woods in 19... 30, 31. Uh, here's there your receipt is. for it. Uh, There's a date on the top, but this is around 1900. Uh, 30, 32. 30, okay. So you can all read that. Robo, 90 bucks, delivery, five dollars, and uh, oars, 375, and a seat back for a buck 50. Ray Telford had to be. And so I, that now is upside down in their own boathouse. It doesn't have water anymore. And the ladies now, in my generation, uh, just painted the, uh, just caught, we caught the rope and they just caught the plank and um, painted the hull. The green part, the interior, when they hired a uh, sort of carpenter for mine, they spent a lot of money making it beautiful inside. So I can, when I get too sentimental, I can stick this on that boat. Because I also do pump, pump consultant. So anyway, we have good relationships. There. So Ray, such an interesting guy. Oh. That's the old county high school that stood up on between Fifth and Sixth Street, where the Grandview apartments are now. If you know where those apartment buildings are, and so at the top of the cupola there. On top. Well, just building those to get over fear of heights. And then, uh, item Local Man is the hero of a film episode. So, 1925 and in the early 1926, uh, a Hollywood movie was shot in Time of Falls. The movie was called The Ice Flood. The working title was Crashing Earth. But uh, Ice Flood was the title of it when it came out in uh, 1926. Big name movie stars at the time, Viola Dana and Kenneth Harlan, this uh, silent film. And one section of the film, 
they needed to have the Kenneth kind of Harlan paddling a canoe down the river in front of the ice flood to sort of rescue uh, Viola Dana. But of course, they're not going to have the movie star Kenneth kind of get out in the river and row a canoe. They needed stuntmen to do that. So the movie company put on the stuntmen, but they couldn't handle it either. And so they had to get somebody local, local guide to do it. And so who did they call on? Ray Telford, of course. So I'm going to exit um, the show again here. And hopefully I can pull this off. I'm going to switch inputs to uh, our Blu-ray player. And um, I think I've got this queued up. And go to sleep. Loading. So I think you're going to see is this is Viola Dana, Dana and her character. She has a little boy that's her son, and they're getting ready to read the uh, book. Uh, see if it gives the title Stories from the Operas. And I'm going to speed up here a little bit to get to the part line in the book that talks about. Um, her knight would come down the river and be wearing a coat of shining armor. You missed it. He's up there. Yeah. I want to go ahead and get some. Here he is. John's granddad canoeing down the Klamath River Canyon, the Volcano. We're going to go watch. There he is. Ending here. Oh. Yeah, are, are it's not still... a Telford robot. No. No. Uh, Get some um, more dramatic. <laughs> excuse, excuse me, I'm supposed to be able to see this because it's just a news article. Uh, we couldn't figure out what this is, but you're going to be a bridge structure here. I don't know if that's part of the bridge. But as he goes to these two rocks, uh, is he going to make it? Uh, notice the bridge structure is behind there. So we don't quite have that figured out. Anyway, so um, he makes it all the way down the river and uh, up here. Okay, so Ray's done. That was his uh, two minutes of film in the silent movie in uh, 1926. Wow. Great job. <laughs> now let's see if we can get back to uh, the last couple of pictures, finishing out the story that at least what I've got is to tell on uh, Ray. We actually showed this film at the Thomas County Library about, do you remember the date mm -hmm. on the uh, 10 years ago, maybe uh, there's a scene from the movie. Uh, so this is a story from 1934 where um, Telford, Telford and Clive Thompson, um, formerly with the Lorenz Company, have opened a art and sporting goods store on North 6th Street. Uh, we've actually got a picture that shows that. This is a picture of the um, uh, First National Bank building at 6th and Main. Um, the, the store, uh, the Telford and what was the other guy's name? Not important. The store is right there. Let me zoom in on that. There we go. Whoops. Let me back up. I'm sorry. There you can see Ray Telford Sports on North 6th Street. And here's an ad, uh, ad announcing a complete line of Spalding athletic goods, including baseball sides and tennis supplies. And of course, fishing. Ski? Yeah. Right. Uh, so here's a uh, fantastic picture of Ray. This appeared in the newspaper, although I couldn't find it today uh, in the paper, but we've got a beautiful print of it. 
And when that came time for Ray to pass in 1968, there was just this red brief obituary here. By this time, he was living in Salem, I guess. I'm right. He moved with family business ventures, my family. Okay. Uh, so he just got a very obituary. After such a colorful career in Klamath Falls, he just gets about five paragraphs here. That wouldn't do for Nelson Reed. So Nelson Reed uh, contacted uh, the news Herald the News. Oh, I want to zoom in on this delightful picture. That was in their living room in their home on Conger Avenue. They bought in 1919. What an interesting life he saw. He was a fun grandpa. <laughs> so about four days later, this story appeared in the newspaper um, with uh, comments from some read. Um, who's identified here as a Klamath City Councilman, a businessman here in town, uh, big on local history. And I think he probably went in the newsroom and say, okay, you guys blew this. <laughs> Let me tell you great about uh, Ray Telford. And so he relates quite a few stories. And the story was too long to get uh, onto the screen here. But here's the last picture I have to share with. Yes, this is a Telford boat, right? Yes, um, this, this is a boat. That's H.C. Telford's grandfather and uh, his daughter, Jessie, who lived to be 99, is a fantastic, amazing woman, um, um, on uh, Upper Time the Lake. But that boat was sold to Addy, A-D-Y, who in turn sold to Mr. Steele, the superintendent of the Crater Park. And what I read, maybe the echoes, was that that was the first tour, but somehow got him into the water. And I have a photo showing boats, uh, you know, big big boat went over the side, and row boats, and this boat, all in the same photo on water right away. So I'm speculating to some degree here, but I think that uh, the Echoes article that this is probably the boat in a very sleek little launch and small enough to uh, send it down to the snow slider or even maybe switch back it down the Fleetwood uh, Cove Trail. But, well, in this picture, they're on Lake Iwana. Right? Yeah, that I, back in the background. Is that, okay, I see Lake Iwana. You're right. Yeah. Um, but this boat belonged to Able Lady, then that's another. Oh, they will do a whole program on Able Lady. I'll, I'll try to get you that text. I don't remember where I read. I've been, I've been looking at things. Just quickly, my great aunt Jessie taught country school at Lost River and Parker, Parker um, Spencer Creek, you know, the old uh, route field that is now the Highway 66 route to Ashland. Um, she had a one-room schoolhouse and wrote beautifully on Lost River. And one of her jobs was to uh, meet, go to the home of every student, uh, you know, and talk to them about the kid and, and commute by boat often from Lost River to the family home in Crown Falls. And the brothers, three brothers, older brothers, who all don't here on the running tour, will often transport her. Then um, AC died of consumption, tuberculosis, at the age of 60 in 2015, uh, 19. And instead of going to Stanford, which she'd already been accepted to, she stayed home to help them. Uh, but she also has read a little story from uh, another relative, um, Tim's. Cousin, one of the second cousins recently. She went to Albany College for a couple of years, and as a freshman, she was on their debate team, which won the state competition up in Portland. And, and the professors uh, voted her to be head of the debate team for the next year. I mean, this is a freshman little girl. <laughs> Quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're going to give us the hook here in a minute, uh, John. I've shown my last picture. What else did you Oh, really? I, I think I, I've made enough noise. Um, <laughs> it's just a lot of things here and here, and I've learned more tonight uh, than five years ago. Uh, so it's, it's been really fun. It's fun growing up with Grandpa. He was the one I spent most of my time with. You know, just, just how much rope to give a kid, climbing trees, building forts, and the river, you know, keep them alive. It's so nice. <laughs> so now it's just really warm for my heart. This is an item that donated, that, but that's a pocket tape. Goes up to 24 inches. It's so beautifully made. So that was HC. Uh, thank you for a wonderful job. Thank you.
Well, any questions? We said maybe just one or two quick learning. If not, let me just conclude with a couple of remarks. Then you know it's, uh, it's such a fun job to have. It's a very rewarding uh, place to work. This is one of my favorite chapters. You know the boating history of the basin. Uh, to have this boat that's been sitting up on top of an exhibit case that honestly I never paid that much attention to. Lynn, she our previous curator that many of you will remember, he pointed it out to me and said that's an important boat up there, but we never really talked about it much. But what a privilege it was to get that boat down yesterday and make it available for you all to see I to have these tools and to have a grandson here who has these stories to hand on. This is really what we're about in this business that we do here. I'm grateful to everybody who tuned in. There are members of the Telford family that are attending by Zoom. And so we thank them for uh, tuning in as well. This meeting is going to be recorded. Bill uh, Lewis, the uh, technician for the Historical Society, is going to be processing it and uploading it to YouTube, uh, assuming everything turned out right. If it didn't, then we'll come in. And <laughs> family requests. Yeah. To have to uh, record this meeting. And so I'm happy to hear that. Super. So, anyway, thank you to the Historical Society for allowing us to present. And that's it for this evening.